Eastern University. It's my privilege and quite a blessing to welcome you to the closing banquet and commissioning ceremony to honor the class of 2014. We're here to celebrate and honor and encourage the students in MA and organizational leadership, MA in international development, and MA in nonprofit management class of 2014. I would like to give thanks to Holly Barrow, our commissioning speaker, for taking the time out tonight to share with us what the Holy Spirit has laid upon her heart. Holly, thank you. Special thanks also to the spouses, the family, and the friends of the class of 2014 who have joined us. You know, and they know, exactly how much encouragement it took from you to get them to this point in their program. And finally, a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us tonight. Before we turn to the Lord and Savior in prayer about the commissioning service, the students sitting before you tonight in their caps and gowns have been working hard through their master's program. They're approximately halfway through. <laughs> Just about completing their last residency together. It is the last time they'll be together physically, many of them, and that's why we do the commissioning service. Only a few of them as a cohort will probably make it back to St. Davis for the graduation, although we would love all of you to come back if it is at all possible. But of course, they'll be together for about nine more months online, talking, growing, and continuing to learn together. And we give thanks for that. So to celebrate the joy and delight God has given them in their friendships and a part of the cohort, to encourage them to keep walking in faithfulness and strength over the next nine or so months, beyond their studies, work, callings, and relationships, and we want to encourage them to anchor themselves in processes of prayerful discernment as they seek to glorify the Lord in all ways. Class of 2014, may God bless you and us through this evening. You are an inspiration to us in so many ways. Let us then turn to the Lord to dedicate this evening to him. We'll now have the opening prayer by Gavosi and Pond. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Um, I'll pray in Chichewa and then I'll pray a little bit in English. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Mungu watu, atate watu, tukwe amikani niku tamandani, kwaja tisikula lelo. Ambuye ni ndi mungu, niko ndi mungu wa mpamu. Ndi mungu, amine majita zonsa teka. Zimena ampana zona wakini zonsa teka mungu mazipanga, Zikalezo so, Madeos and Asiana. Sit with the Kaja de Zoroes and Muye, the Pagan Puya Pamasopano, Matsuano, Pereca Uremu, Dimata Mando, Zinalan. Ziko Mut Pajami Royao. Father God, as we come before you this evening, we humble ourselves before you, O Lord. We pray, Jehovah, that you will start with us in this program, 
and that you will finish with us. As we draw close to you, Jehovah, we pray that, Lord, you will draw near to us. We pray for the evening. We commit each one of the glass of 2014 into your hands, O oh Lord. We pray for them because we know you have called them. Each one of them has a specific calling for God. That's why we pray, Father, that today would mark that time where, Lord, they will think about where you have called them to go and make a difference. Lord, we pray as we enjoy ourselves, even as we fellowship together, that your presence will be with us, O oh Lord. Bless the program and each one of us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And representing the International Development Program, we have Daniel Human Gabe. Ladies and gentlemen, um, members of the faculty, uh, my fellow students, I'm very honored to be speaking to you this evening or today. Um, I would like to uh, speak to you for a few minutes about my journey uh, through my studies. I will also share a bit of our journey as a as a school or, or class of international development, but I will pay much attention to my journey and then I will go on to explain what we have gone through as a group. Uh, the education that I received, ever since I was a kid, when I attained and I was able to go to school for the first time, it was an education that helped me to be the person that I, I am today, but at the same time, it had some disturbing, um, when I look back, I said some disturbing elements, because it did not encourage me to think, to think for myself. It was that kind of education, whereby a professor or a teacher pause things in your mind and they don't give you an opportunity to think. In Africa we always go down the stream to fetch water and what we do to collect water to get into our containers is something we call a funnel. Some of you might not know about it but I'm used to that because I used to do it. So my professors and my teachers since my primary school have they were taking this funnel that I don't know the name of it, put it in my head, and begin to pour their ideas in my mind. But they never allowed me to think for myself. Uh, when I started at Eastern, I realized that that was not the approach that Eastern University is using. For the first time, they gave me an opportunity to think for myself. And for the first time, I was able to disagree with my professors. <laughs> I remember when we were doing economics for, the, for developing countries, I decided to take an opposite uh, direction uh, that was contrary to what we were reading in the textbooks. And I did that on purpose, not because I disagreed completely with the textbooks and the the, the, the direction that the professor was guiding us through, but it's because I wanted to experience and to enjoy the freedom <laughs> without, without the professor pointing at me and telling me that I'm wrong. And the final paper that I submitted for that class, I told my professor that I've really enjoyed all the ideas that I have and the concepts that I have acquired during this journey and that you probably saw that I was taking this negative side but I did it on purpose. 
So I'm so grateful that Eastern has enabled us to think critically and to have the freedom to think. It's, it's, it's my first time. It, it's my first time to, to think without and to respond and to give answers without a teacher saying that this is wrong. I, th throughout the, the program, I have not seen any comment from the professor which says that what you answered is wrong. Of course, they have posed some questions that helped me to guide me, but they have not said that what you answered is wrong. That's something that I've never, uh, that I had never had an opportunity to experience. I was always told you have to answer according to what the professor taught you. And my culture is that culture, and of course most African cultures, are those cultures that teach you to respect those people in authority, and that's very good. I'm not criticizing it. But the side that I don't like is when the person in authority is telling you to do something that you don't agree with. You don't have the right to question them. I didn't find that here at Eastern University, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I went through a struggle to attain my education. I remember the first time that I went to school, I was eight years old. And it's not because I didn't want to go to school at an early age, it's because I couldn't afford it. My father was not able to afford that. I'm, a, I'm, I'm um, the last born of eight, and I was born in Uganda, but I'm originally, my parents were originally from Rwanda, but were refugees in Uganda. So I was born in that situation, and it was difficult for them to send me to school. When I went to school for the first time, I was eight years old. And I went through a lot of struggle, and I won't go into details. But finally, I was able to complete my high school. And when I completed my high school, I joined the Bible school. And the Bible school took a different and an opposite direction, I would say, from my secular education that I had received. My secular education did not allow me to think for myself. And the Bible school professors did not help me to, in, to, to integrate my faith into what I had learned in my high school. Of course, they taught me wonderful concepts and good things, and I'm not, uh, 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 I'm not criticizing them but they failed to help me discover for myself what it means to integrate your faith with what you do, with your daily work, and with what you studied earlier. So that, I remember one day I was sitting um, in front of my small room at the Bible College, and I was reading this book, a textbook about introduction to missions. And the author was saying, I'm just going to paraphrase what he said. I don't exactly remember uh, the words, but this is how he said it. It was something like similar to this. The, the, he said the, the mission of the church is to preach the gospel so that souls are saved. It is not to do charity, pursue justice, nor be engaged in developing initiatives that reduce human suffering. That's the last part that I added, but I'm quoting what he said. The mission of the church is to make sure that souls are saved. It's not charity, it's not doing justice, it's not getting involved in all those development initiatives. Although he thought that those were good things, but there were, there, were side, there were things that were not important to the mission of the church. 
I sat in front of my, my room and the questions began to go through my mind. I respected professors, I respected authors of my textbooks, but this really disturbed me. And since then, I wanted to go to a school that would help me to integrate my faith, what I believe, what I believe to be the mission of the church, and help me to integrate it with something that can reduce human suffering. And And then I got a job with a microfinance institution, which is driven by Christian uh, motive. And I was able for the, for, for the first time to do something in the lives of the poor. Yes, I had tried, but I don't think that I did it right. But for the first time, I was introduced to interacting with the poor who are extremely poor. And I remember this lady. I always visit her, she's one of our clients in Rwanda, and she was raped in genocide. But before she was raped, you know, yeah, they, they raped her, but they made sure that they, they raped her in front of his husband, her husband and her children. It was during genocide. Several men raped her in front of her husband, in front of her children. And after they raped her, they killed her husband, three of her children, and one of them was in her back. She was several months old. They shot her in the back, and the bullet hit the kid. She didn't die immediately, and the mother did not die. Thank God she's alive today. But after a few hours, her kid who was in the back died. And she told me that she was she, she was almost dying, and she wanted someone to help her with water. She couldn't find it. I won't tell you what she drank, because most of you would not believe it or take it. She survived, but she survived, and she's now HIV positive. Those men who raped her were HIV positive. And for the first time, I was able to do something in my life that I had always believed that God was calling me to do. I ministered to her, we provide uh, loans, small loans to her, and she was able to do some, some business. Now she's able to send her kids. Two, two surviving kids are in university now. She's able to pay for their ed education. And now I'm asking myself, is the church really not called to serve and to minister to such a people. If the church did that work, would really that be considered a secondary work? Or is it really a primary mission of the church? I believe it's the primary mission of the church to preach the gospel to serve souls, but also to minister to the people like Chantal. I will use the name Chantal, I don't want to mention her real name. But I believe that the church is called to serve those people, to serve their souls, but to serve their bodies as well. I believe that the church is called to minister to people who are like my sisters, who have never been to school. As I told you, I'm the last one of eight, but none of them has been able to attain an education. You can imagine that my nieces and my, my nephews, who are they're now 27, their mothers cannot send them to school. You can imagine the work that lies ahead of us. And I would not, if someone in authority back home comes to me today, after this process of my education at Eastern, if someone came, one of my leaders, and say the church is not called to do charity, development, and pursue justice. I would stand on my two legs and, and question their ideas. I would stand on, on my legs and say that's not what scripture say. I would stand on my legs and say the primary mission of the church is to serve the poor. Now I, I have confidence. And the confidence comes 
because of the professors and the leadership of Eastern University that has helped me to integrate what I believe with what I do. And thank you for that. Allow me to, uh, to say thank you to Eastern U uh, Leadership, Eastern University Leadership and the faculty for the good work of preparing us to go out and minister to people like Chantal I mentioned, to women in Congo who are being raped every day. Some time back I was reading this newspaper and it, it said that 450 women were raped in a single day in one township in Congo. Will you tell me that the church is not called to do something about that? I won't believe you now. And allow me to say thank you for helping me uh, to discover a biblical based understanding that social justice is part of the church's primary call and responsibility. And allow me to say thank you to the leadership of Eastern University for helping me to discover tools to serve the least of these as I endeavor to reduce human suffering as well as environmental suffering or creation suffering in an effort to build shalom on this earth. Now, Professor Flick introduced me to this idea of shalom. I knew about Shalom, but it was during his class, during the residence and post-residence, that I was able to grasp it, this idea. And the subsequent classes, of course, helped me to grasp it. Indeed, we are called to bring Shalom to growing, to growing creation so that it can enjoy restored relationship with its creator. And thank you for guiding us to discover the relationship between reason, faith, and justice. God bless you.
The MA in International Development Program, we have Heather Visco. Next, we have Kara Edson. <laughs> Tanika Hoffman. Adriana Manu.
Nash on behalf of the not for profit and also the Lords. So we are a very small cohort. We have spent some time over the last 12 months letting our professors know that uh, we may not have quantity, but we are quality. <laughs> So tonight I'd just like to share with you a little of our story and how it's played out over the last year. Although our individual engagement with the graduate program started long before the summer of 2012, our stories first intersected at Palmer Seminary last year. And it was there that this small group began to write a new chapter. It was a somewhat disparate group of people who arrived last summer from places as diverse as Pennsylvania, <laughs> Indiana, <laughs> South Carolina, Texas, and as far afield as Australia. 30 years separated the younger student from the oldest student. It was an eclectic mix of Gen X, Gen Y, baby boomer <laughs> and a gender mix that would never comply with equal opportunity legislation at least in Australia <laughs> but for all the diversity and gender imbalance as we started to share our individual stories about how we came to be at Easter a common thread began to appear woven seamlessly throughout each of our narratives a thread that revealed the hand of God who had clearly directed our paths and brought us to this place at this time. We quickly became a group where friendships were forged, born of a deep respect, a willingness to learn from one another, our faith in Jesus, and the ability not to take ourselves too seriously. Throughout the year, that disparate group was transformed to a desperate group. <laughs> As together we navigated the world assignments, deadlines, adobes and postings. We prayed and we laughed together. We encouraged and supported one another. And in Australia, we call that mateship. It is the highest calling of friendship. When we returned to Easter this summer, we were minus our Texan with his French press <laughs> and minus Peggy, who was our supplier of snacks. We were all a little older, some were a little wiser. We were less desperate and a whole lot more desperate and more determined to see this master's program through to the end. Miles Horton said, we don't automatically learn from experience, we only learn from those experiences that we learn from. So what profound lessons have the not-for-profits and the laws learnt over the last year as we have engaged at the School of Leadership and Development? Well, we've learnt that we can actually live on far less sleep than we previously thought. <laughs> We've learnt that our places of work, back in the real world, don't need us as much as we thought they did. <laughs> we really are dispensable. Okay. <laughs> We've learnt that a well thought out and carefully structured marketing plan, you can successfully market anything of strategic value including medication for giraffes with headaches and horses with acne. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> We've learned that there's a direct correlation between the capacity for rigorous intellectual engagement in class, the quantity and quality of the coffee consumed. <laughs> and after living and working with so many talented females, Ryan has learned <laughs> and even if polygamy was legal, it is not a plan worth pursuing. <laughs> 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 and Henry, our towering teddy bear, 
Texas. <laughs> 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 has learned that he actually can't live without us after all. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to say we're really delighted you heard that. Yeah, and we are so that. blown away that you came tonight. More importantly though, we have learned that those who teach us, our professors, have with tough minds and tender hearts reflected compassion, care and the love of Christ. And tonight we want to say thank you to those faculty members that we have been privileged to learn from. You have inspired us with your stories, you have encouraged us to frame our learning and discourse through a biblical lens. And you have relentlessly challenged us to think more deeply about issues of social justice and faith and how to integrate those into our world. We are richer for having had the opportunity to be a part of the School of Leadership and Development at Easter and meeting and learning from all of you. Because I'm doing the speech tonight, I get to do that. And from the script, I'd like to take a moment, especially, to thank Leslie and Amber, Ryan, Mia, Henry, and in fact, all of those that have been part of all of the programs over the last 12 months. I have been inspired, I have been challenged, and I have been humbled by the privilege of working alongside all of you, and I thank you for that. I am asked often back in Australia, is it really worth it, travelling so far for such a length of time away from family and home? And my answer has been always resounding, absolutely. I have been so blessed and I thank you all for that. And so, the question needs to be asked, where to from here? Where will this chapter finally end? Well, we have another year of adobes and postings, <laughs> sleepless nights and deadlines to meet. We are preparing ourselves for a chapter that includes frustration and exasperation desperation and deprivation, <laughs> and hopefully, come May 10th next year, exhilaration. Yeah. But whatever the chapter holds for each one of us, whatever twists and turns our stories take as we continue to write them in the years ahead, we hold to the truth that his penmanship really authors our stories, and we can replace our trust. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, we read a verse that is not unfamiliar, I'm sure, to all of us, and one that I hold to often. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me. Find me when you seek me with all your heart. Can I ask that you would join with me prayerfully as I read a beautiful Franciscan blessing for all of us as we go into the year ahead and as we take and synthesize all that God has taught us through this program, epitomized, I think, in the incredibly inspirational message that you brought us to. That is what we are called to be. Change agents. Bringers of mercy to the people that God calls us to. So can I pray, will you join with me? May God bless us with discomfort and easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our own hearts. May God bless each of us with anger and injustice, oppression and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger and prayer so that we may reach out our hand to comfort them and to turn their pain to joy. And may God bless 
each one of us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and to the poor. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. God bless you. Our commissioning speaker, Ms. Polly Barrell. She's the Associate Provost of Finance and Administration here at Eastern University. Polly holds a BA in Economics from Gordon College and an MBA in Economic Devel Development from Eastern. She currently serves as the Associate Provost of Finance and Administration with a dual report to the Provost and the VP of Finance and Administration. Her 23 years on staff have allowed her the opportunity to help launch and grow the Adult Accelerated Programs, assist in curriculum development, teach in the MBA program, direct conferences and continuing education, serve as Interim Dean of the Campola College, as well as Interim Vice President of Finance and Operations. More importantly, Holly has two daughters, 13 and 16, and a 26-year-old stepdaughter, and is married to her husband, Pete, who owns a web optimization consulting company. She has a variety of experiences, including directing a home industry, school, and business in Haiti for three years, serving on staff with InterVarsity, coaching at the collegiate level, being involved with youth missions, and serving on various boards. While family obligations brought her back from Haiti, Polly is passionate about issues of justice and economic development and is pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you tonight. So can you just give a round of applause for our speaker? on the podium so let me know if you cannot hear me in the back I know the air conditioner makes it a little bit hard to hear so I'll try to speak out um, as I was thinking over the last couple weeks of what to say tonight I found myself thinking about who would be in the room and the amount of the variety of people the depth of experience and I found myself starting to think you know I'd be a lot more comfortable analyzing a spreadsheet than doing any kind of public speaking <laughs> And then Daniel and Jennifer had to get up and speak, and now I'm ready to just go home and sit down. <laughs> I really did appreciate what you both had to share, so thank you for that. Um, I decided to share a story with you that has been very encouraging to me, especially over the last couple months. It's about a girl, and her name is Ruth. She comes from a culture where women don't have any rights. Her marriage was arranged by her parents, her parents are not religious, but I would say they're superstitious. When an opportunity came up to marry into a foreign family, they decided to take it, even though this family treated their family as an enemy. They took it because this family was believed to have spiritual power. So Ruth finds herself married at the age of about 14 to a young man whose people hate her people and a family who worships a God she doesn't know and she feels powerless. Her mother-in-law, whose name happens to be Naomi, becomes a widow, and Ruth finds in her a woman that she can both respect and admire. However, then Ruth's husband dies, and her mother-in-law makes the decision to return home to her people. Have you caught on to the story yet? <laughs> Ruth insists against Naomi's wishes to, to accompany Naomi back to Israel, the famous story of Ruth and Naomi. It is at this point in the story that I would like to share with you a scripture verse that I will offer to you as a verse for you to take from tonight in whatever stage, whatever step of your journey that God is, is moving you forward into. It's from Joshua 1.9, also a very common known verse. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you should go. Another word for strong is bold. So you could say, this is my command, be bold and courageous. 
And I want to use BOLD right now in the form of an acronym to give you, to continue to tell you the story of Ruth and why that story means so much to me. The B for BOLD is brave. Ruth had to be brave to leave everything that she had, everything she knew in her life, to follow her mother-in-law to another country where she didn't speak the language, where she didn't know the culture, where she didn't know the religion, she didn't know the, the ways that things were done. So she reached down deep inside her and she said, this is a woman I'm going to go to, go with. This is someone whose God I have learned to love and I'm going to follow her. It took courage, but something deeper was driving her. Ruth had discovered God through Naomi and was willing to give up everything to do what God was calling her to do. For many of you, you have already taken steps in your lives that has required courage and strength. For some of you, maybe that step of courage was to come to Eastern and start your degree. For others, you don't know what steps God has planned for you. You still have a journey of perhaps many, many more steps that are gonna require courage. So God is saying to you, this is my command. Not a suggestion, not an idea. This is my command to be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Let me go back again. This is my command. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you will go. I just came from a missions trip with 31 middle schoolers. <laughs> Yeah, where I saw God work in the lives of these kids in the town we were in in just awesome and amazing ways. A lot of what the leadership team was calling God moments by the end of the week. But it was the ride home four hours into a seven hour trip after a week of way too little sleep where missing our exit had us pull off the highway outside of New York City only to find that one of the four vans had an emergency light that came on that stated that the brakes were failing and we could no longer drive the van. So we pulled into the small pizza place with 31 12 to 14 year olds, where the owner was sitting at the table and reading a Bible. He invited us in as brothers and sisters of Christ and says, make my place your place. Um, while we couldn't get the van fixed and we couldn't find another van to rent, we started to strategize on what we were going to do to get home. In the meantime, a police officer came up to us and said, hey, there's a park right down the street. Maybe you could take the kids down there to throw the frisbee and run around a little bit. We ended up singing and dancing in the parking lot while we waited for rides to drive up from Philadelphia to pick us up. The kids posted on Facebook that night that it was the most, sorry, I get uh, emotional about this, that it was the most powerful part of their week. Two kids accepted Christ that night because the car broke down. So when I think about God moments now, even when things are looking out of control, even when I don't understand in the journey what God is allowed to happen, I remember the verse to stay strong and courageous because wherever we go, God will be with us. The O in bold is for outrageous. Ruth's story continues as she goes to work in a field to find food, knowing that she could be setting herself up to be abused and perhaps even enslaved. She rises before the sun arises. She goes and she does grueling hard work all day long to try to bring home a little bit of food for herself and for her mother-in-law. You are trained or being trained to be agents of change, agents of reconciliation, agents of justice. You are being trained to be outrageous. Jesus was outrageous. He hung around with non-Christians, those who didn't have it all together at the church, perhaps those who were struggling with addictions or issues such as homosexuality that the church had already condemned. He hung out with those who didn't have it all together, with those who needed what he was bringing. They weren't the easy ones. He had a choice. He could have been in the in crowd, the cool crowd. He could have been accepted in the church. He could have been in. He knew what to say, he knew how to act, he knew what to do. But that's not what he chose to do because he didn't want to hang with the church folks because he knew what his call was and what his mission was. So our call isn't to the easy road either. It's to be outrageous. Maybe 
that is in pursuing your degree. Maybe by pursuing your degree at whatever stage you are in your life, your family is looking at you and going, that's outrageous. <laughs> For some of you, maybe accepting Christ was outrageous. Um, it's something that I think we can often take for granted, that that can be a decision that, can, that people can consider to be outrageous. It might be that you are thinking that you are going to go overseas or into the city, and you're going to change the people that you're going to work with. And perhaps being outrageous means you don't go in to try to change, you go in to be a partner with. When I first went to Haiti, the country was at work, and there were four changes of government in the three years that I was there. I had friends and family who openly accused me of being crazy and selfish. I was humbled as I struggled with the language, but I was celebrated with a friendship with a Haitian woman who is a friend to me today, who came alongside me, and because she was willing to partner with me, the work was able to get done. You know what, though? That time in Haiti wasn't necessarily the hardest time of being outrageous in my walk with Christ over the years. I find it harder sometimes to follow God in the day-to-day -day areas. Sometimes when he calls me to stand up against gossip, or to love the annoying folks, or to love the people who have hurt me or hurt others in my life, or to trust God when I can't always see the end of the path. So I want to encourage you and promise you that God is calling you to be outrageous. You have to figure out what it means, but it is in Him and with His strength that you can do that. So we're at L in the bold for loving. Ruth had believed in Naomi's God to be her God, and in doing so, she now had a purpose in life that allowed her to love beyond her human abilities. God puts people in our lives. Some of them, I think you would agree with me, they're easier to love than others. Sometimes we have friends who are easier to love than others. We can have a good community. We can have a good church. We can have good classmates. We can have good coworkers. We can have those who do what we teach and what we advise, and we're happy and we can love them. But love isn't always easy. Sometimes we're hurt by love and we want to protect ourselves. Sometimes we limit, we limit love to only a part of its completeness. Sometimes we put love into a caste system and we dole it out to those we think deserve it. Sometimes we create justifications on why we can't love fully or why we can't love at all. My darkest journey of my spiritual walk was getting to a point in my faith where I could trust that God loved me so deeply with a love I couldn't understand, even when he would take away from me someone that I loved. Ruth lost a lot. But she knew that God had taken the root, that God had loved her and had taken her in in all of her unworthiness and everything about her. So I promise you again, if you haven't already, you are going to cross paths with people who are hard to love, and you will be challenged to guard your heart. Love, God's love, a love that is beyond our ability and beyond our understanding, will be your greatest gift to the people that God is calling you to serve. Another commandment, not a suggestion, another commandment is to love, is to love. Um, sorry, lost my place, I'll come back there. Um, to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and to love your neighbors as yourself. It takes the first to do the second. So as you are going out to love others, make sure that you are right with your relationship with God and have the love of God, not your own love, that allows you to then be able to go forward. Love is by God's grace, and grace is new every moment. Moment. So when we fail, which we will, the miracle of love and grace allows us to start all over again. I'm to D, which means I'm wrapping up, okay? Fourth letter, <laughs> bold. Um, to be brave, to be outrageous, to be loving, and to be daring. Ruth obeys Naomi. And if you know the story, she goes and she lies at the feet of Boaz while he's sleeping on the threshing floor. She wasn't ever in a position of power. She was never in a position of authority. She had very little going for her when she stepped forward to do what she felt God was calling her to do. She dared to be loyal to Naomi. She dared to trust in her new God. 
you may find yourself wondering how you should serve, how you should be daring. There's a lot of scripture that you can go to. 1 Peter 4.10, 1 Corinthians 12.4. They both talk about our spiritual gifts. And they talk about spiritual gifts being a supernatural ability that God gives to his children so that, so that they can advance God's purpose. So a couple things from this. One, you have a gift. Maybe more, but at least a gift. It wasn't given to you by accident. And it all comes together to form a whole for the kingdom of God. We can be daring because we have God. I want you to close your eyes for a second while I read some words. And as I read these words, I want you to picture in your mind the word that I'm going to say. A piece of stationery and a pen. Allow that to fade in your mind as you start to visualize a computer filled with email. That now fades from your mind as you look to your phone filled with texts. Now a record album that becomes an eight-track tape. All right, some of you are too young to know what that is. A cassette tape, a CD, an iPod. Back to a telegraph machine, an old-fashioned phone, a wireless phone, a cell phone, a horse pulled buggy, an automobile, a jet plane. Okay, you can open your eyes. But you may be thinking, okay, yeah, Polly, we've progressed, we've changed, we've moved forward. Those are all things that have taken us on. <coughs> Hebrews 13.8 states that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Things continue to change around us. They'll continue to change as you finish up school and as you go into the next phase of where God is calling you to go. But God doesn't change. So when you start to experience the change and perhaps it gets frustrating or scary or something else is happening along the way, and you pick up your cell phone or you get on a plane or you listen to music, be reminded that life changes but God doesn't. The same God of the Bible that was the God of Ruth is the God who's calling you forward to be bold. My story, perhaps a bit boring, maybe typical, I accepted Christ when I was in junior high. I struggled all through high school trying to figure out what this meant to be a Christian in high school. I finally found my own faith when I got to college, and then I lived happily ever after after that. All right, no, maybe not so much. However, 30 years later, um, I'm humbled in every circumstance because I find myself keep learning new things about this God that I have known all my life. Life is an adventure. Do you know what the pur our purpose of life is? Throughout scripture, we are told that our purpose is to glorify God and make his name known. I don't know that I knew the purpose for life when I headed to Haiti for the first time at the ripe old age of 23. Was I called there? I didn't think so. Was it my plan for my life? Oh no. Did I even want to go? No. I shed a few tears wrestling with where my life seemed to be going. A colleague challenged me and said, God is either going to change his call or he is going to change your heart. God changed my heart. One of my college professors had shared how he was offered two jobs upon graduating from graduate school. One was in Boston, the other was in Chicago. He literally drove to the intersection of town where he needed to go east or west. And he prayed that God would tell him what job to take. He pleaded with God to show him his will. And all God said to him was, glorify me in all that you do. Another professor told me the story about how he started medical school and then dropped out and went to law school. And while he finished law school, he then felt called to business. So he went and got his MBA, and he landed a high finance job, but he wasn't satisfied. And it wasn't until he went back to teaching that he found himself fully satisfied with what he was doing. I asked him, I said, well, were all the others mistakes then? And he goes, oh, no. He goes, I am who I am today because of each step that I took in my life. Sometimes we might be blessed with a full business plan that spells out our whole path, but often, we're just given enough information to know the next step. Ruth, 
She left her comfort to go where God called her, one step at a time, not knowing the end of an amazing story. She was bold. In conclusion, I want to introduce to you a book that I was given about a year ago called 1,000 Gifts by Ann Boscombe. It has become my latest source of strength and encouragement in my life. The author shares her story that includes not only the heart-wrenching death of her younger sister, but the realities of becoming a Christian and still struggling with severe anxiety and depression. She's challenged by a friend to keep a journal and to find a thousand things for which she can be thankful for. So Anne begins a journey that has her studying more deeply the meaning of being thankful to God, arguing that thanksgiving, a word that comes from Eucharisto, breaking of the bread, is the key to fulfilling our purpose in life to glorifying God and to making him known. Anne pointed out to me that ingratitude, or not being thankful, is being ungrateful for all the things God has given me. It's the first sin of humanity and that which made Satan fall. My Achilles heel is to worry. I know it's a sin because it says to God that I don't trust him. John 6, 29 says this is the work God has asked to believe in him. This is the work. It's work. It doesn't happen just overnight. Belief is a verb. It's something you have to do. Stress and anxiety is one extreme, or thinking you can do it all yourself as another extreme, are the lies that separate us from God. A habit is a behavior that has been repeated over and over again and tends to occur subconsciously. And in her book, states that the habit of gratitude, which will keep us close to God, is intentional, childlike, and practiced. She said, a nail is driven out by another nail. A habit is overcome by a habit. So you are going into a new phase in your life, whether you're beginning school, ending school, or in the middle of school. You have another chance, a chance to start over, so to speak, a chance to develop new habits. Your time in school or your next steps after school are one time to explore ideas with friends and family and colleagues and to grow in your faith. Your time preparing isn't just now, it's the rest of your life. So I give you this command and this promise. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you will go. Dr. Eric Flint, so that he can just bless us with the closing prayer. I think I want to stand here. <clears throat> That's okay. I've been shouting at my cohort for the past two and a half days. And I've lost my voice. I have a colleague who said, um, true learning isn't taking place unless there's genuine animosity between the student and the professor. So I think we've done some good learning. Um, <laughs> Let me uh, pray for you all as uh, we make a transition to a, the next thing. Clawing my way to the finish line. Lord, first off, we give you thanks um, for our room. We give you thanks as a uh, faculty member, as a teacher, uh, for our room full of idealism, of courage, commitment faith, creativity uh, that we need on a regular basis to kick out the cobwebs, the ever lurking cynicism, the pessimism that there's nothing left to do in the world to change. Thank you for these students and the various gifts they bring into uh, our classrooms. We thank you as creatures created in your image for bestowing upon us multiplicity and multitude of gifts. Some of us know what those gifts are. Some of us don't. Some of us have gifts we don't think that they're spiritual gifts. Open our eyes to see those things that we do well and that we dedicate to your good work are gifts that you have given to us. Lord, there's creativity in this room, courage in this room, skill in this room, 
there's probably a lot of excitement and anxiety in this room. We pray that you will gather all of these things together. Take each person, fill them with gratitude for family, friends who support them in different ways, and help them to boldly seize the mission that you are calling them into, knowing that you go ahead of them, that you are behind them, and that you are a brand improviser who can take whatever they offer and turn it into something that is a manifestation of the kingdom. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.